Chapter 6 What is Unconditional Election? Events at this point of time were unfolding so quickly in my life that I didn't even know if I could take much more excitement. I was a pastor of a church, preaching and ministering to my people day by day. And I could soon be involved in two searches, a search of pursuit of a young lady and the pursuit of a theological viewpoint which wouldn't turn me loose. Actually, both pursuits were already underway. The one, the theological one, was in high gear, and the other, the pursuit of the young lady, had possibilities of soon moving from low gear to second. I hadn't taken up Todd's suggestion that we double date the next Wednesday evening, and not because he wanted to borrow the five dollars. I was somewhat shy and feared a possible rejection if I called her by phone. Instead, I suggested to him that we go to the girls' church next Wednesday evening. My pastoral duties spared me the Wednesday evening service because of the distance from the school. I further suggested that we sort of play it by ear when we got to the services and see if things might open up for us to take them home. I had no idea whether Terry would be interested in me or not. And I thought if I visited her with her now in an attached status, she might give me a clue or some means of encouragement if she was interested. This suggestion didn't set too well with Todd. He loved to call a girl on the phone and thrill her, as he put it, with the invitation of a date with him. But there wasn't much he could do but go along with my suggestion, seeing I had the car and the money. We decided we would go to that next Wednesday evening. No use wasting any time. On Wednesday afternoon, I had my second appointment with Dr. Sisk, at which time we would talk about unconditional election. Armed again with my notes, we engaged in conversation late that afternoon, following the same procedure as before. I began with eagerness and much more confidence than in the first meeting. Unconditional election is the act of God whereby he chose a group of people before the foundation of the world to be his own. This group of people is known as the elect. I looked up for approval from Dr. Sisk, or for a signal to continue in my explanation. He led me on by asking, what was the basis of God's choice in these elect? The basis of God's choice, I continued, was nothing within these people themselves. It wasn't any goodness because we've already seen that Calvinists believe in the total depravity of all men. I wasn't yet aware of the difference between infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism. In fact, I couldn't even have spelled or pronounced these words then. I continued again, noting, Neither was it any faith that God foresaw these persons would place in Christ, because, again, we have seen the Calvinist belief in man's inability to have faith, except God gives it to him. The only basis the Calvinist would allow for the election of his people in light of their depravity and inability, I now say that emphatically, as I saw clearly the relation of the first and second points of Calvinism, is the will of God and the will of God alone. The Calvinist would say that it had to be the will of God and the will of God alone due to two facts. First, there was nothing good within any man that would make God choose one over the other. And second, man could not choose God because of his powerlessness. Therefore, God did not choose men on any basis of men's ability to choose God. I was glad at this point that I was, with Dr. Six's permission recording these sessions because I could never have stated the matter quite like that again. At this point, I showed Dr. Sisk a brief outline I had constructed, which set forth Calvinistic view of unconditional election. 1. God has a group of people the Bible calls the elect. 2. God has chosen these people to be his own. 3. God has chosen these people to be his own before the foundation of the world. And 4. God has chosen these people to be his own on the basis of his will and his will alone, and not on the basis of anything he saw or foresaw in them. I noted for Dr. Sisk, I'm sure he knew it already, that the real point of separation between Calvinists and others was the fourth statement. Others would agree that God had a group of people who were his own, ones he had chosen before the foundation of the world, but the real point of separation was the basis of the elect's choice where it was something in man or the sovereign will of God alone. I had read that phrase somewhere in my study. I explain it is because of this one point that the Calvinist view is called unconditional, because election finds no condition in man for God's choice. The choice is completely with God. 
Dr. Sisk agreed, and then offered. Yes, that is called God's decree of election, and is certainly based on God's sovereignty will and his will alone. Would the Calvinist believe that um, God's decrees and his sovereignty extends to anything else besides election? My answer to that had to be that the Calvinists believe that God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. I anticipated Dr. Sisk's question. Does that mean that God has decreed sin? I admitted, yes, according to the Calvinist, God has decreed all things, even sin. But he is not the author of sin. I anticipated his next question. What would you ask the Calvinist? Concerning his view of God's predestination and election of all things, including his unconditional choice of a group known as the elect and his predestination of sin. I was ready this time. I had spent a few moments jotting down some questions for the Calvinist on this issue of unconditional election. My list went as follows. One, does not such a view of election, God chooses one over another knowing that all men are equally sinners, leave us with an unjust God. Two, why didn't God choose all men as the elect, if he is the final voice on who is saved and who is not? And thirdly, if we say that God has decreed all things, including sin, are we not making God the author of sin? Dr. Sisk seemed pleased again with our session had gone so well. He complimented me on my thinking, analysis, and objectivity in handling the subject matter. We made another appointment for early next week so we could discuss limited atonement. The evening went as well as the afternoon discussion period. Todd and I went to the girls' church. Terry did give me encouragement to see her home, as did the girl of Todd's interest. So we went out for a burger and coke and then took them home. As we drove back to school after the big date, I paid little attention to Todd as he rattled on and on about how this was the girl for him. He said he knew his track record had left a lot of broken hearts along the way, but this girl and situation were different. She was a girl he was going to marry. I chuckled under my breath as I found myself thinking the same thing. I have just left the girl I'm going to marry. I had a little confidence in Todd's conviction, but I was certain concerning mine. I laughed again as I thought, sure, sure, that's the girl I'm going to marry. It's been predestined from the foundation of the world. Was I beginning to think like a Calvinist? Whether Calvinist or not, this night my heart was so smitten with Terry that I hope at least she had been predestinated to marry me.